I'd like to share a few thoughts with you, and not necessarily as announced, because I think, I mean, we've heard that harm reduction is under pressure. Specifically in this country right now, it's like a hard time. And you should be aware that like the pressure is coming from all kinds of sides, and sometimes from sides that you wouldn't expect to be important. And I'll try to show that by giving you some insight into how the war on drugs actually shares common territory and also rhetorics and tactics and strategy with the war on doping. Um, and I'll do that by talking a bit about how these rhetorics use what I can call myths um, anchored in moral panics, moral crusades, moral entrepreneurship, and, and how this, this fuels these, these efforts against drugs in and out of sports. And it's in pursuit of legitimacy and means. I mean, how, how can the people who push these efforts get the, the power to be able to continue doing that? What is important is that we understand those myths, that we recognize those myths, that we can debunk them. We can debunk them publicly and make people understand that it is myths, it's, it's not truth, it's, it's false. Um, I'll give you then an outlook as how I'm looking uh, upon these things for the future and a little wrap up. But wh why did I get into this? Because I'm, I'm a physician, I'm an exercise physiologist. I'm not into drugs in the first place. Well, two things happened. I married somebody who was in harm reduction. That was the first thing. And then I stumbled upon something. I'm not sure if you are aware what's happening in elite sports, but it's amazing. If you're an elite athlete today, you have to report four times a year, three months in advance, where you will be in the morning, in the afternoon, where you will sleep at night, in order to open the door at any time of the day and be obliged to give a urine sample in full sight of an officer who looks and makes really sure that it comes out of your original anatomical orifice. He may also then engage you in, into drawing blood and sometimes even hair is being taken. Where else in society are we using that type of surveillance and repression of some behavior? So I got curious and I said, why? why does this happen and how does it happen? And why I think those questions are relevant. I mean, are we going to a society where we'll all have to give our urine samples from time to time because maybe we're taking stuff that is considered uh, like deviant? Or are we opening the floodgates and let do whatever? Or maybe it's like a middle pragmatic way where, for example, harm reduction has its place? I think it's important questions and, and we should be aware it's not all only, only about psychotropic drugs and it's not only about drugs and doping. These two territories clearly share a common field. When I talk about myths, I'm talking about their contemporary meaning of false beliefs or ideas. And it's not only about inventing stories. I mean, we just heard some examples from Carl that also in science we create myths by showing science which is actually wrong and then gets like a, an, an, a ring of truth because it was published in a, in a paper and in an in a, in a impact factor important journal. We should recognize that these things are so important in rhetorics on, uh, on the dangers of performance and also psychotropic uh, drugs. And this discourse really is similar in, in both wars. So debunking these type of discourses, I think, is very important. Some elements about moral panic and myth. I mean, you know about moral panics. There is a newsworthy event. Something happens and the media flavor the event, make a big story out of it. There is an orchestration of a crisis and it gets like moral panic-like characteristics. And um, uh, very often it then stabilizes and there is like a myth coming out of it which is then perpetuated and used over and over to keep a certain way of dealing with the so-called problem then in the future. It's an adjectivated response, it's too much, it's, it's not in, in, um, in uh, it, it, it's too much for what the problem actually is, but it needs also regular repeats to keep momentum. Not all of these things are, are moral panics, as I will show you. Um, moral panics is, it, it, it is very short-lived, it's volatile. Uh, uh, it, there's a, an exaggeration of the number of individuals that engage in some deviant uh, behavior, at least what is called deviant. Um, 
it can also be more like a, a moral crusade. It's, that's to say that it's something that continues over time, uh, and, and you'll see in sports, it's more, more or less uh, that type of, of, uh, of uh, thing happening. Very important are the entrepreneurs that, that push these type of agendas, and it's very important to recognize who these people are and to expose their, their sometimes really flawed reasoning. I'll quickly go over a few examples that most of you probably know, but I think it's good to show these and to remind you of these, these things uh, that happened over time, specifically, of course, in, in North America, but also elsewhere, so that you then better um, uh, understand what, what's happening now in sports, where these sim similar type of, um, of myth creations um, uh, take place and are used in, in the rhetorics of, um, uh, of the efforts against, against doping. So opium, I mean, remember, late 19th century, Chinese immigrant workers come to America, there's lots of work, they need the workers, there is some um, 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 an important immigration, and then there is economic crisis and there is a split labor market. Uh, the, the, the white population has the higher paid jobs and the Chinese population does the, 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 the bad stuff. But then there is economic crisis and there is competition for jobs. And really, based on this problem, it turns into a racially uh, fueled uh, story of, uh, of uh, opium crazed coolies, the yellow peril, and it in the end leads to the first American anti-drug law, um, uh, outlawing the smoking of opium in opium dens, and of course the opium dens are run by the, the Chinese. Uh, co cocaine, we, we've heard already a story of these bullets that you can draw into, uh, shoot into a heart of a, of a of a, of a black person that then continues to fight and, and, um, uh, and then fueled the myth of the crazed black uh, on cocaine. Again, it's anchored in, in racial questions and it led to the Harrison Act of 1914. Marijuana, the same story. I mean, it's, it's Mexican immigration in the beginning of the last century. Again, with a split labor, uh, split labor market and then competition for jobs and, and how to get rid of the Mexicans. Well, we... we um, we make them um, into a, a crazed Mexican rapists and um, in the end it comes uh, with lots of other stuff around it to the um, federal law, of, uh, law against um, marijuana, against the American Medical Association's advice. It followed then with crack, 1980s, we know the, the story, um, where it's, it, it's a total reaction out of proportion of what actually the problem is uh, and this incredible idea of, of pushing, uh, punishing 100 times harsher for crack as compared to cocaine, totally in disproportion of what it actually means. It continues. Crystal meth is uh, still today one of those problems, and, and, um, and Carl has looked into this, um, uh, as he just showed, much in, in detail. And clearly, again, also showing that science sometimes is playing also an important role in, 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 this, uh, in this perspective. There's biased scientific research that's being used to push the agenda further. An example from Holland, more recently, you may have heard about that a couple of years ago, there was a, a big outcry for a major magic mushroom ban in the Netherlands because a French girl dramatically jumped out of a window after consuming <coughs> mushrooms. Um, but there was a, of course it's, it's drama and it shouldn't happen, but it was totally out of proportion with regard to the reaction to that. And it inspired uh, somebody to publish the following <coughs> cartoon in a Dutch newspaper, which I think speaks for itself and it's, there's no comment to make. Um, a totally out of proportion reaction to, uh, uh, of course, dramatic case uh, of mushroom consumption, where the causality actually had not been proven so much. From your own country, you all know, of course, the story of, of David Nutt and Equisi, an overlooked addiction with implications for the current debate on drug harms, um, where in the end he was sacked as the, as the president of the, of the Parliamentary Commission on, on Drugs because of, um, of, uh, of this, uh, this position that he took, which actually, if you look at the numbers, is not that, uh, uh, not that strange. I mean, he, he, he does make a point, uh, as I'll show you later on. And drugs and risk, I mean, we all know these figures, and of course you can debate about them, and, um, uh, and, and uh, it, it needs to be, um, to be perfected. But clearly, I mean, alcohol is, um, is, is a big player, and, uh, and, and as is tobacco, and we really deal with these type of problems in, in very different ways. In the end, also important to realize that it's institutionalized, there's a drug war industry with prisons, law enforcement, and science, everything is, is fueling itself and wants to be perpetuated. 
And Carl makes a good statement uh, this, um, this uh, last summer at the symposium in, in Geneva, and he said, follow the money. I mean, there is $1 billion in taxpayer-supported uh, money available to do drug research, but uh, you have to do certain types of drug research if you want to get funded, as he just uh, alluded to. Now, in anti-doping, the same thing happens. There's also construction of falsehoods. Um, and I'll give you a few uh, examples uh, where, where you see these falsehoods being constructed and being used, perpetuated, used in, in the literature, both lay and, um, and, and, and scientific literature, to advance the agenda. And the first one is Arthur Linton. Arthur Linton, uh, a British cyclist who, um, who won some very important races, and he's always advanced as being the first victim of doping. In every book you open, you'll, you'll talk, they'll talk about Arthur Linton, the first victim of doping, somebody who killed himself by taking substances. And it's a frequently repeated story, and which is, the thing is really interesting, is that you can recognize the citation chains because there are erroneous dates. The, the, the year changes at some point in time, somebody makes a mistake, and then like three, four, five, uh, scientific papers later, you still see the wrong date. So people don't go to the original source. And actually, he probably died from infectious disease two months after his victory uh, at the Bordeaux Paris race. So there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that there was a direct relationship between his using performance enhancing drugs and, and, and dying. Knud Ermak Jensen, which is like the hallmark figure with regard to the beginning of the anti-doping um, uh, efforts by the International Olympic Committee, died in 1960 while being engaged in a 100-kilometer road race during the Rome Olympics. Um, it's a frequently repeated story and every time it comes back. Amphetamines is what killed this guy. But there is a question there. That the evidence base, again, is very, very shallow. Um, it's probably that he, very much more likely that he died of heat stroke, of fall, and brain trauma. He, he, he fractured his skull. He fell off his bike. It was very hot, very uh, uh, warm. He was dehydrated. Again, the, the causal relationship, uh, and, and I, I, I see the, the similarities with the example of PCP just presented by, by Carl again uh, also here. Tom Simpson. Um, from, from, uh, from Great Britain, who died on the, on the Tour de France in 67, is another example. Steep ascent in great heat. I mean, they shouldn't be running at that time of the day on their bikes. Uh, uh, amphetamines, it's, it's not that clear. It's probably heat stroke and non-optimal medical care. He was not being taken care of in a medically optical way, optimal way. Another example of a myth is a wonderful one. It's the Goldman Dilemma. In a, a sports medicine book in, uh, in uh, 1978, Gabe Merkin published his, uh, his research where he said to athletes, if I could give you a pill that would make you an Olympic champion and also kill you in a year, would you take it? And more than 50% said yes. Bob Goldman then repeated this and, um, and did the same. And again, more than 50% of the athletes he asked the question said that they would do that. The problem is that the Merkin study probably was never done. It was just something that was published in a, in a uh, sports medicine book. There is also doubt about the Goldman study. And the only real published evidence in an uh, uh, editorial policy paper shows a different story. Um, it was done in, in uh, Australia and also in, in North America. And uh, why would, would they dope? Revisiting the Goldman dilemma. And actually, it's a minority of athletes that would take such uh, incredible risk. Another example is the so-called uh, EPO-myth, erythropoietin, which is a hormone that stimulates the production of red blood cells, which is of interest for uh, endurance-type uh, uh, sports athletes. And the invention of a drug of mass destruction is the debunking of this myth that lots of cyclists were dying in the 80s and 90s in Belgium and Holland. He did the math and just showed that the background uh, uh, death uh, risk of dying uh, of um, acute uh, heart death or acute death was normal, uh, normally distributed in and outside of, of, these, um, of these populations. So absolutely no evidence whatsoever, whatsoever that there was this um, increase in, in death from um, extra use of erythropoietin. So it seems that there are similarities and actually maybe even overlap. Maybe part of it is just one war one effort. 
Remember, recreational drugs are also on the list of forbidden substances for athletes. Why in the heck is cannabis on the list? It doesn't make sense. Do you think you're gonna run faster when you take a joint? I don't think so. What is the evidence that you will do better when you take cocaine? There is no evidence. And then, Australia is a very interesting example. The Australian Football League, it's a strange type of football that they only play in Australia, by the way, they are promoting a zero tolerance for recreational drugs that goes beyond well that is required. They try to be an example and really push that agenda very far. And why do they do that? Actually, if you then try to understand, it's in search for legitimacy. They want to keep the power as a league over the organization of, of sports. The problem is that all this is trying and going beyond sport. You could think that maybe if it were only about elite athletes, okay, we make an exception for elite sports. There is something there that we want to protect. However, it leaks into general society. Here is a very important example. Denmark. The left smiley is the sticker that has to be put on the door of the fitness if, as a fitness, you do not subscribe to anti-doping Denmark. By law, you're obliged to do that. However, you can choose the right sticker with a nice smiley, and then you're also obliged to pay a few thousand pounds a year so that officers can come to your club and check your clients for forbidden anabolic steroid use. It doesn't matter why they would do that. Also, when they're outside competitive sport, just go there and do their weightlifting for physique uh, questions, they'll have to comply with it. And if you're found positive, and about 20-25% are found positive, you're kicked out of the club, you cannot participate to any organized sport-like activity in Denmark anymore. So something that goes way beyond elite competitive sport, out of proportion of what it actually means. Which then instilled, of course, some people to react to it and publish this on the internet. And yeah, sure, there are health risks. And, um, and, and, and I'm glad that Jim McVeigh is here in the audience. And, and I'd like to cite him because this was published in Lancet and says, here what's happened, the dire consequence of doping. That's what happens when you use anabolic steroids. And Jim, he said, yeah. But we have to be very careful. Sure, this can happen, but it, this is an exception. And if, if we just only show this, I mean, we're not credible anymore. As, as doctors, as, as professionals, if we only show these type of things, the only thing that happens is that people who have this type of behavior, they'll, they'll run away from us and we won't be able to keep in contact with them and, and trying to bring them harm reduction measures to prevent this type of, of, of effect. And yes, health risk, but, I mean, there are some, some studies out there that have looked at it in a more, uh, like a, a more sensible way with greater numbers. And actually, if you look again, Carl said it very right, 80 to 90% of drug users, they don't have problems. Again here, anabolic steroid use can be done without problems. And also, it's not true that they begin as, as kids or adolescents. They, they, started, they started later. It's a highly educated Caucasian, gainfully employed, 30 years or older, earning a good income, not active in organized sports, and motivated by increased skeletal muscle mass, strength, and physical activities. And it is a recent use. So why all these all this things happening? I think it's in pursuit of legitimacy and means. There is lots of um, power play going on. And, and, and the way to push their agenda forward is to get an agreement of the public and of politics for a zero-tolerance approach with more repression and more surveillance. So moral panics, myths, and moral crusading, moral entrepreneurship is helpful for, this, for these agendas. And who benefits? It's good to remind ourselves. It's, it's the World Anti-Doping Agency, the International Olympic Committee, the sports federations, and also an, an incredible anti-doping industry. National anti-doping agencies and laboratories, they're huge. Here I show you a photograph. We used it already for an article uh, uh, at the occasion of the 2012 Olympics because it shows the, 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 the people who were involved in, in launching the, uh, the anti-doping efforts for 2012. 
and, and, and I think it's an iconic photo because it shows the Ministry of Sports, uh, it shows the responsible professor for the anti-doping, plus a, a director of the sponsoring company that gave the laboratory. And, and, and look at their smiles, and, and, and I mean, wow, it's, it's just, it speaks for itself. I'm afraid that um, there will be more of the same. Zero tolerance is, is extremely expensive. Moral crusading fuels support for more means. Anti-doping needs regular occurrence of scandals. And think about the Russia scandal and the Athletics Federation. And there are some moral crusaders out there. Dick Pound is, uh, is, uh, is one who's pushing the agenda very much right now. But also think about SEPCO. I mean, you wouldn't think of it, but I think that SEPCO is dangerous for harm reduction in England because of the zero tolerance agenda that he pushes for sports. It, it is kind of a backdoor for coming back to, uh, we want to uh, eradicate drug use in general in society. And it goes very far. World sports today is imposing supranational rules and national legislation follows. Um, there are countries in the world where there is now uh, criminal law that uh, r runs these type of, of problems. Um, uh, there is pressure for doing the same now also in Germany. Um, there is also pressure for doing similar things here in, in England and Great Britain. Criminalization of doping and doping-like behavior is, is very near or already there in some countries. Um, if you're caught with some, uh, some uh, testosterone and you can't explain why you have it, uh, you may be fined or even put in prison in Germany in the near future. This comes, of course, with excessive cost, limited efficacy. We know that. Zero tolerance doesn't work. Prohibition is an error. And yes, of course, drugs, bribery, the cover-up, these are big problems, specifically the one in the middle, bribery. Think about FIFA, UEFA. There are some problems to be solved. But I don't think that um, zero tolerance with regard to drugs in and outside of sports is the answer. Harm reduction is. To wrap up, I've, I've given you some examples of myths in, in, the, in the war on drugs. I think there is good reason to, to think that exactly the same is happening with regard to anti-doping. It's anchored in moral panicking and moral crusading uh, type of effects. Um, it's all in pursuit of legitimacy and means. How can we push those agenda further? Um, uh, we need to fuel like outcry and then, and then uh, bung down. It all has also a lot to do with un in inequity. And there are also racial questions, of course, specifically when we're talking about psychotropic drugs that are playing an important role. Deconstructing, debunking myths and showing falsehoods in everything that's being said is important and we have to make our voices heard and, and, and tell the public at large that these things are not true and come with more evidence and evidence-based policy making is important, of course, and I'd like to add and underline that advocacy is, of course, part of that. Thank you for your attention.